at speaking, but please feel free to ask a question anytime. Um, you can put those in the chat box to the right side of your Zoom, or there's a little raise hand button um, that you can use. It's above the chat box and that'll flag us that you have a question. I don't mind being interrupted. Um, we'll have time for Q&A at the end also, but um, feel free to, to stop me if you need to. You can also ask questions anonymously if you'd like. Um, and to do that, you can open the Google Slides. Slide 35 is our parking lot. Um, you're welcome to put your name in there or obviously if you wanna ask an anonymous question, please don't, that's optional. Um, but we will put any questions that we're not able to get to there um, so that we can revisit and get you those answers. Again, the chat box is a really handy tool for us this morning. So if you have any tech issues, please let me know. Please let Jen know. Um, and otherwise, you know, take care of yourself. And I hope that we have a good morning together. So we wanted to take a minute this morning just to acknowledge that it's International Overdose Awareness Day. Um, we wanted to take a moment to uh, pause and remember folks that we've lost and honor their lives. Um, and so if you'd like to open the chat box or if you'd like to open the slides, you're welcome to edit this yourself. Or if you'd like to put the name of anyone that you've lost in the chat box, um, I'm gonna edit this and we can, um, oh, there's the chat box, perfect. And we can um, edit this slide. just like this. And if I need more boxes, I'll add more boxes. Cool, good morning, Claudine. Thank you for introducing yourself here. I just wanted to take a quick moment, just a quick moment to acknowledge folks here. Oh good, I see some people in here. Anonymous Raccoon and Grizzly, thank you for joining our slide deck. Also, if you're unable to open the slide deck, if you have somebody that you would like us to put in, please type their name into the chat box and we, we can type it in for you. Yep, you can always use that for any sort of tech issues or if you're having trouble with the slides. And it would be handy to open the slides at this point. Let us know if you have any problems with that um, because we'll be using them for a couple activities. Cool, I see folks joining in the slide deck, perfect. And thank you for folks who are sharing names. I wanna remember Joe and Dave, Dan and Paul and Adam. Let me just take a few more minutes here. Thank you for this moment of silence. I appreciate it. All right, feel free to edit that at any point or put those names in anytime you need. I'm gonna go back into presentation mode here. And I'd love to check in and have folks introduce themselves if possible. Um, come off mute whenever you're ready. My name's Christine, I'm a consultant with HIPS. Um, and I think I'm this uh, number six cat today. I'm feeling pretty good. I like to train. I love talking about harm reduction. And I'm really um, just pleased and honored to be here with you all today. Um, so whenever you're ready, please come off chat. Um, and if folks are not ready to come off chat, we will, uh, we will volunteer you. So <laughs> please introduce yourselves this morning. Okay, I'm gonna go first. My name is Will. Uh, Will Barnett. I work for Prestige Community Resources. I'm the president of, it's a nonprofit company. 
Wonderful. And um, <laughs> I'm feeling pretty good today. Great. Um, beautiful day outside, in spite of the weather. Um, I'm feeling good. Great. Glad to hear that. Uh, good morning, all. Peace and love. My name is uh, Brother Ibrahim Laos. I'm with Far Southeast Family Children and Collaborative, and I'm, I'm just excited uh, to be here. Wonderful. Thank you. Welcome. Good morning. I'm Emily Miller. I'm with Far Southeast Family Strengthening Collaborative. I am a family support worker, and it is a beautiful day. Wonderful. I have not been outside yet today, so it's, I'm really glad to hear that it's such a nice day. All right. Uh, good morning. My name is Ernest. I'm from Prestige Community Support Walker. Feeling good today. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning, I'm Ed O'Neill. I'm also with Prestige, uh, and I'm feeling awesome today. Okay, lots of good vibes in the room. I like it. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. My name is Anyaba Wabez. I work with Prestige. I'm CSW. I'm good today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Hello, good morning. My name is Teresa Delaney, and I work with Far Southeast Collab. My role is a family support worker, and I'm feeling like number four today. <laughs> I hear that. Oh, my goodness. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Nikita Galloway. I'm with Far Southeast Family Strengthening Collaborative as well. I am a family support worker, and on the scale of CAT, um, I'm gonna give myself a nine. All right. Oh, that one's cute. Yes. <laughs> Tom says hi. <laughs> uh, hello. Good morning. Uh, my name is Erica Hollins. I'm a family support worker with Far Southeast Family Strengthening Collaborative on the school-based team. Um, I am. I would say I'm a cross between a two and a six. Um, uh -huh. a, a cat mostly because I haven't eaten yet. Um, but number Angry. six. Yeah. <laughs> um, but number six because I'm in front of my own cat and his uh, energy just makes me happy. So that's great. <laughs> Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Soraya Wright. I am a family support worker with the Far Southeast Family Strengthening Collaborative. And at any given time, I'm generally um, one of the cats on the left hand panel, one, <laughs> one, four or seven. Those are great cats to be. All these cats are great cats. Well, anyone else that hasn't introduced themselves yet? Hey, good morning. My name is Karen Wilson. I'm Assistant Family Services Director with Far Southeast Family Strength and Collaborative. And I think I'm that two and six also. Um, probably because I haven't eaten as well. Mm -hmm. so. When I haven't eaten, I'm more of an eight, if I'm being honest. So <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. make sure to get something in me today. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, all. Uh, this is Claudine Sherwood, and um, I had a personal high. Um, just got off the phone a couple of minutes ago with a family member with great news. So I can't find the really excited happy cat. Oh, not the wonderful. six. Six looks a little. Um, mm -hmm, she looks like a six. Um, <laughs> so I am going through four and seven. I keep promising to do number one, and um, I will tell you honestly, my heart is heavy with the um, loss of Chadwick Boseman, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, but um, I do believe in living life forward. Thank you. Thank you for bringing his name into this space. It's really important for me to know where everyone is at just to take a temperature, and um, that honesty is appreciated. Thank you. Let's see, anyone else that hasn't introduced themselves yet?
Jen, does it look like we've gotten everyone? Oh, Jen. Hmm. Jen hasn't introduced herself. Hey, everybody. I'm Jen Jackson. I work with Health HIV, and I'm the um, the manager on the DC Engage project, um, and on the team with Christine. We are working together on this. Um, and if I have to pick my kitty that I am, uh, this morning I was feeling kind of like, uh, full disclosure, seven. After last night, I had had a little, I imbibed. But uh, this morning I was super excited. So I, I'm probably a six at this point. Six is kind of my resting, my resting state. So uh, I'm really excited to be here. And I'm excited that you're all here and attending today. This is yes. awesome. Thank you so much for everyone's time and attention. We so appreciate it. All right. Anyone else? Jen, does it feel like we got everybody? There was an Erica on there, but and she she couldn't speak. She said she was logging off and logging back on. Oh, yep. I don't see her back on yet. She is coming back. That's true. You're on mute, Jen. Sorry, that was Eliza. She also uh, works for Health HIV and uh, she was having trouble with her microphone. So she will be back in, I think, shortly. Okay, well, yep, Eliza is part of the team on mm -hmm. the DC Engage project. So we'll just do a little introduction for her. Um, I'm not sure how she's feeling today yet, but hopefully well, um, and we will keep moving on. Thank you for the introductions. It helps to hear what everyone's roles are, where folks are coming from, um, just for some context. Okay, so this is the first activity we're gonna try out in the Google Slides. So for those of you who were able to access them, um, thank you, I see you up here anonymously. Um, this allows us to do a little bit of anonymous temperature taking um, so that folks can feel more comfortable responding, et cetera. Um, if you need to access the Google Slides that I'm talking about, um, please do not if you're in your car, of course, but they are in the chat box. Um, and I can reshare the link if we need to here. Copy this. Oh, Jen just shared the link. Thank you, Jen. So if you could pop into the Google Slides. We have a question here, how familiar are you with harm reduction as a philosophy? Just so we can get a sort of sense of where folks are coming into. Um, if you'd like, you can come down here in the lower left-hand corner, you can see a bunch of stars. Grab a star and put it wherever on this spectrum you lie. If you're unable to, thank you, Jen, it's slide eight that we're on right now. If you're unable to do it, et cetera, if you wanna sort of give us an idea in the chat box, you're welcome to do that as well. If you wanna stay basically anonymous, you can do that to Jen privately. We can pop these stars wherever they kind of lie. Totally new, wonderful, welcome. I love talking to folks new to harm reduction, fairly familiar, great. I love it. And I love these anonymous animals that I get to see. Great. I'll give it just a few minutes, totally new, perfect. Thank you, Ibrahim. While folks are um, engaging with this slide, I just wanted to let you know um, as part of a little bit of housekeeping. After we're done, you'll get a link to a survey, um, just a little bit of an evaluation of the training, some satisfaction questions, et cetera. Let us know how we did, how we can improve. Um, if you'd like to get a certificate of attendance for this training, you can do that um, by completing the survey. We'll also be sending out a PDF of these slides afterward. Um, so as you take notes, you don't have to worry about capturing everything. Um, we will um, we'll have this available for you. Wonderful, wonderful, um, wonderful. Yes. 
Christine, I'm not able to grab a star. I'm not. Oh gosh. Okay. Are you in the slides? I thought I was. Okay. Um, let's see. Anonymous Ebex is here. I see you. Would you like me to place a slide for you? Or a sure. star, I'm sorry? Sure. Put it between familiar, fairly familiar and an expert. Perfect. And for our other like familiar folks and experts, if you want to share your experiences, share your, um, your expertise, we are glad to have a lot of knowledge in the room. I'm also having a little technical difficulty being able to grab a star because um, I'm not at my computer right now. Oh, no but, problem. Um, can you grab one for me? And of course. It, um, a little past, fairly familiar. Perfect. Thank you for indulging me in this activity. I got excited about it when I learned how to try and make these trainings more interactive. I don't just want to lecture at you all day long. I am used to training in person. And so being a lecturer on Zoom is not my preference. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Um, so how familiar are folks? Great. Um, we're going to move to slide nine right now, as you can see. And how comfortable do you feel putting harm reduction into practice with your participants, with your clients who use drugs? Um, let us know sort of uh, the sort of practical aspects of those things. How do you feel? And I'm happy to place anything for folks who would like to pop in the chat box or come off mute. And that is slide number nine. Christine, you can put me close to I got this. I got this. There we go. Love it. Okay, this is working. This is kind of working. Great. Um, yeah, you can put me close to, um, well, somewhere in between I got this question mark and I got this exclamation mark. Nice. Perfect, perfect. And it is okay to be nervous about putting things into practice. Some of us just haven't had the opportunity to work with folks who use drugs. And so we would be new in that way. Cool. You suggested that we share our experience, strength and hope about um, what makes us um, comfortable and not comfortable with Pardon this me? Activity. Will, you re will you repeat that? Um, were you suggesting that we share our experience about why we're comfortable or not comfortable? If you'd like to, please do. Okay. I've worked with substance abusers for over 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also in recovery. Um, I uh, started doing harm reduction or trained in harm reduction activities in the early days of the HIV uh, thing, probably in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. and early 90s um so um Thank this is the population work. i enjoy working with the most wonderful and, um, and lived experience is invaluable oh absolutely absolutely this is um this is a place where that particular experience is um very very much valued and a, a bonus in the work so thank you for your work yeah all right, let's keep it moving then. So I'm gonna go back into presentation mode. Um, Jen, since we're gonna start, um, since we're gonna start more in um, earnest here, should we start recording? It's, I've been recording. Oh, you've been recording. Never mind. Yeah. wonderful. So I just okay. wanted to make an announcement again. If you do not want to have your face on video, because we made this at the beginning, uh, announcement at the beginning, just turn your, um, video off um and it'll you your your you won't be on video but yeah we're recording this just so we can have this and then also like uh, christine said everybody will also get a pdf of the slides afterwards cool all right so we're talking about cultural humility today so we wanted to start with some basics what even is cultural humility right um, there are going to be some links and sources in here um, that you're going to be able to access if you want to read into it more. The National Institutes of Health defines cultural humility as a lifelong process of self-reflection and self-critique, whereby the individual not only learns about another's culture, but one starts with a, an examination of their own beliefs and cultural identities. 
right? This was coined in the late 90s and originally used as a tool for physician training for working with diverse populations around the United States. A couple things to know about cultural humility is that um, remembering we move between several different cultures often without thinking about it. This is um, you know, what intersectionality is referring to um, in terms of power analysis. Um, and so being aware of sort of your own values and your beliefs, where all, all of the sort of cultures that have influenced you that you identify with, um, that um, is important to understand when we approach cultural humility. You've maybe heard of some other terms like cultural competency or cultural reflexivity. Um, and cultural humility is a little bit different, right? So the goal of cultural humility is learning about another culture um, rather than reflecting on one's own background. Cultural humility um, uses the term humility, humble, right? Um, in, in opposition, not in opposition, um, instead of competency because competence implies that um, there's an endpoint that we can um, at any time that we can absolutely know another culture and then we're sort of done with learning and cultural humility wants us to continue asking questions and wants us to remember that that lifelong learning um, is is the value that cultural humility holds and that cultural humility requires a historical awareness, right? So in order to really practice it, being aware and sensitive to historic realities like legacies of violence and oppression against certain groups of people. And so to build trust, those historic systemic reasons for mistrust must be excavated and made visible. So this applies to um, a lot of our populations, whether we're talking about black and other people of color, whether we're talking about people who use drugs, it's important to understand those histories of oppression. And so the principles of cultural humility that we wanna just incorporate in our work um, is an, a real commitment to lifelong learning, which I find um, just really fun and interesting. It's what makes the work interesting, just continued learning about people. Um, there's never an end point to learning. I learn something new from everyone I meet. Um, and some critical self-reflection about um, why, why do I have this reaction maybe? Why, um, what, is there a point where maybe my assumptions have been wrong um, and really being open to that sort of self-reflection. Recognizing and challenging power imbalances so that we have respectful partnerships, right? Um, we as service providers automatically hold, um, whether or not we like it, we hold a certain amount of power, we hold access to resources, um, and recognizing that this power imbalance exists and trying to level that as much as possible with the folks that we work with, which I imagine is something that everyone here already tries to do. And then institutional accountability um, is really important, right? So we talk about how we need to understand systems of oppression, points of violence and oppression that um, often institutions have instituted. That's very, very relevant for folks who use drugs, who've been, um, who have been marginalized. Um, I use that word as a verb because people don't choose to be marginalized. We put them on the margins, right? Um, and so folks have experienced a lot of, um, a lot of uh, discrimination and a lot of violence from institutions like hospital systems, right? Like, um, like our criminal justice system. Um, and so we want to understand where, um, where those points have existed. If there's, um, if there are any barriers to service within our own institutions, trying to hold ourselves accountable and change those policies and procedures where possible. Okay, so we're gonna do a little bit of journaling. I'm gonna read this prompt in case anyone is not able to access slides right now. Um, and just sort of thinking through about your, your own feelings around harm reduction, which can be complicated and that's okay, right? Um, and so if you could just pick a number do you support the use of a harm reduction approach from definitely no at minus three to definitely yes at plus three? And just think about that for yourself. We won't be asking you to share right now. But for folks who might not be able to see slides, 
Harm reduction is defined as an approach to treating the negative effects associated with drug use. The harm reduction approach does not aim to punish the users of drugs, but to lessen the negative consequences surrounding drug use that affect both the user and the community. One form of harm reduction is methadone clinics. Methadone is used as an opioid substitute treatment. The goal of this treatment method is to replace the illegal drug that the user is currently using with methadone. I'll also note that methadone and buprenorphine are the only two um, medications for opioid use disorder that have been shown to reduce uh, fatal overdose risk by as much as 60%, which is very exciting and important. Because methadone can be carefully administered in clean facilities, the users will no longer have to use their drugs in the street and other dangerous places. Similar to methadone clinics, some countries have implemented the use of safe injection sites that are designed to provide the user with a safe and hygienic place to use drugs. Another example of a harm reduction approach is the needle exchange program or syringe services program, as you might know them. This is a program in which drug users who use needles are able to deposit their used needles into a secure deposit box and be given brand new, clean or sterile needles to use without being arrested or questioned for the usage. The goal of this approach is to decrease the prevalence of diseases and viruses that can be passed through the use of contaminated or used needles, right? And is very, very effective. It's one of our most exciting HIV prevention interventions um, and has been incredibly effective, although we, we have work to do still. Perfect. Okay. So thank you for that bit of reflection. I'm gonna keep moving. Wanted to talk a little bit about why people use drugs, right? Here, there are a million reasons, right, for folks to use drugs. There are a lot of reasons on this slide. I'm not going to read these all. Um, having experience with one of these items doesn't imply that you, that you definitely use drugs or have difficulty stopping. It might be a factor, though. Um, and so it's just important that we um, reflect on sort of the complexity of why people might use drugs and the nuance there. Um, it isn't quite as simple as we'd like it to be. If this were all simple, we'd have solved all these problems already. Um, but anything from personal coping, um, experiences with law enforcement and the trauma of that, barriers to treatment of which there are many, right? And any sort of societal institutional disparities or discrimination that can really impact our lives, our experience with trauma, right? If you've been exposed to drug use, we know intergenerational drug use happens. So there are a lot of, lot of reasons. Pain management, sleep or insomnia is a big one, right? Especially when we're talking about stimulants, folks staying up to work, folks staying up for other reasons. This is a spectrum of drug use. I like this. This is my favorite image I've seen so far, although it's a little outdated. You know, we have DSM-5 criteria now, so you see it's a little old. But um, I really like this spectrum of substance use because it acknowledges that there, A, is a spectrum, right, and B, that it runs from beneficial to problematic. And then we talk about, um, we talk about the types of drug use that are potentially harmful they start to have negative consequences, but you know, maybe it stops, right? Or maybe those consequences are not that harmful, depending on what happens. And then we have actual clinical criteria for substance use disorders. And I like that it implies that um, it implies that it um, includes rather that there are beneficial uses to drugs. It includes the use of coffee and tea, wine and tobacco as substances, which they are, right? pharmaceuticals, which a lot of us have a sort of love-hate relationship with often, and that there are, um, there are positive reasons that people start to use drugs um, and that it may not always end up positive, but there can be positive benefits that people gain at some point during their experience with use, right? And that there's also non-problematic use, recreational, occasional, casual with a negligible health or social impact. We wanted to talk about a few theories of problematic use. 
Um, the Drug Policy Alliance had a, an event a few years ago focused on stimulants and the panel discussed a number of theories and they put out a report. You'll see the link sort of on the right hand side since um, I wasn't able to get it on the bottom of both. Um, and so they talked about um, a few theories, right, that, um, that complicate the narrative around why people use drugs and why it becomes problematic, um, why people, um, some people slide into substance use disorder and others may never have a problem. In fact, the majority of people who ever use drugs are not going to end up with a substance use disorder, right? So we have the dislocation theory of addiction, which is summed up in Johan Hari's quote, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is social connection, right? So the perspective that substance use disorder is a response to social isolation because human beings are such social creatures. That's what's natural for us. It's part of what's been really hard about this pandemic, right? That social isolation, physical distancing is a big part of the intervention to keep us safe. And that's not natural for us, right? And so um, thinking about how our society right, has um, served to disconnect us from one another, making people vulnerable, right, to substance use disorder as a form of coping. The self-medication hypothesis, a few panelists there mentioned that um, hypothesis of substance use disorder, um, suggesting that people are using drugs to um, help with maybe an underlying mental health issue, to cope with psychological stress, um, and that the pattern could become problematic and create more harm than it was um, originally intended to, to help reduce, right? Um, if you wanna read more about this perspective, they suggest the work of Dr. Gabor Mate, um, which he um, is, is um, very prominent in this field um, and believes that addiction is an attempt to self-medicate for pain and in particular, the pain of trauma. Oh. oh, great. There we go. Um, behavioral theories, right? Um, that folks, um, that, that positive reinforcement is a critical point in which um, that, that it can help increase the likelihood that someone continues to use drugs, whether it's stimulants or other drugs. And in the case of stimulants and in the case of opioids, right, there's a, euph there's a euphoria that you experience from using these drugs. And that can be a positive reinforcement physiologically, um, a desirable feeling, right, to help, um, to help create the vulnerability to a substance use disorder right, particularly when you're in an environment where other people are using, where this is normalized, et cetera, right? Um, and some of, those, some of those cultures might include, right, methamphetamine use among gay and men who have sex with men, right? Often part of the party and play culture um, or chemsex, it's also known as, right, where folks are using drugs and having sex. And so there's a normalization of use a sort of different culture, college students who are trying to really um, achieve academically might be taking stimulants for that kind of performance enhancement, right? Um, so that social reinforcement norm can be really, really strong, including and adding on to the sort of physical effects of the drugs. And then biological, right? That cravings exist. Cravings are very real, and as are experiences of withdrawal. With experiences of withdrawal can be incredibly painful. Um, we, we are um, pretty familiar with this around opioid use, right, and the withdrawal symptoms of opioid use being incredibly, incredibly painful. And so the avoidance of withdrawal being a driver for ongoing use, right? So this is not to say that you have to choose a theory, that there's any one theory that's all encompassing or correct. Um, it's probably, depending on the person, a mix, right? Because um, drug use is very complicated. The reasons people use drugs are complicated, as we talked about. And so we just wanna add in you know, some nuance and some complication to this. All right, so we're gonna do a little bit of a brainstorm here. You don't need to click anything or add any text, but if you would come off mute, why might people not be accessing drug treatment is a question that we have for folks to think about. And if you wanna come off mute and let me know, I'm gonna pop these answers in. 
This is Emily. Um, why might people not access drug treatment? Well, well it's, it's a stigma for some mm -hmm. people. It is a stigma and um, people are scared of the unknown. You know, they understand what they, uh, they understand their surroundings with using drugs. However, mm -hmm. when you offer them a new way of living um, that they don't know anything about, it's the fear of the unknown. What is going to happen to me if mm -hmm. I stop using drugs? Am I going to be able to manage? And, and it's that whole, it's the unknown. That's that's why they might not access it. Absolutely. And then some of them are just not, some of them don't believe they have a problem. It's the mm -hmm. denial. They just think, okay, I can still do this. I can still do that. I still have a little bit of, you know, I have a place to stay or whatever. And some of them just don't see how problematic it really is or it really can be. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you for this. Anyone else? Sure. For many people, substance, substance abuse treatment doesn't really exist anymore. Um, Say more about that. A lot of people who um, have lived through the uh, substance abuse epidemic of the 80s and 90s mm -hmm. um, remember the treatment programs that we had. The long-term abstinence programs don't exist. Um, the ones that are still in place don't even come close. 28-day and 90-day treatment um, is not, even the research says that a person has to be in residential treatment for, I think it's 86 days or at a minimum for it to be effective. Mm -hmm. So in that regard, most people are drying out. They'll come back out on the street, use again, and it becomes a revolving door. But nobody's actually treating the symptoms that um, contribute to the use. Um, mm -hmm. Behavior modification has been taken off the table. Uh, in Southeast and Northeast, there's no respite center, there are no detoxes. Um, so in a lot of, in a lot of ways, um, you know, I've been trying to get somebody in treatment now for about two weeks. Mm. And every time that they've gone, there are no beds available or there are no female beds available or, you know, um, there may be something going on in one particular case. We placed a person um, in treatment, and it was as simple as the food. Um, when she got there, it was unacceptable mm. um, because the value of the program was that they focus on being healthy and eating vegetarian. Mm. She wasn't doing it. Mm -hmm. um, um, maybe, yeah, so and, maybe it's you know, not culturally um, acceptable depending on what that means, right? Absolutely. That's correct. That's mm -hmm. correct. Especially when you talk about War 7 and 8. Mm -hmm. um, you have to meet consumers where they are or at least be able to speak their language. And it's not, in my opinion, um, realistic to put long-term substance abusers into a two days in ex of detox and expect that they're going to get it. Mm -hmm. um, and or even in some enough. of the 28-day yeah. programs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for that. I see I see you over here, Erica. Program guidelines are too strict. Absolutely. And there's no culturally uh, well, let me put it another way. Gender specific treatment. There are not enough beds for gender specific treatment. You know, when you start mixing populations men and women in the same program or transgenders and men in the same program, you're going to run into the same problems. You mm -hmm. know, um, there has to be more gender specific services that are available. A woman with children, completely different issues than a man who's, you know, been using um, and got criminal involvement. Um, we start mixing those pots and labeling everybody as a substance abuser without looking at the subtle differences between each group. Mm -hmm. And consequently, your outcomes are going to be um, skewed. Absolutely. And thank you for bringing up children and the, the acceptability of having children in a program. 
where are you going to put your kids if you're going to a program, if you have them, if they're not allowed to be with you? We used to have women and children programs in the district, but women could go with up to two children and they would treat the family. Wonderful. It's been taken off the table. So in that regard, um, we have basically dismantled the system and replaced it with nothing. Mm-hmm. Hi, I just wanted to add something. My yeah, name please. Is I'm joining a bit late, but I just wanted to contribute. Welcome. Thank um, you. Thank you. Um, it, it basically is a cycle that's not supportive. Um, the old school thinking was that the consumer needed to be clean before receiving therapeutic treatment. But the substance abuse was the self-medication. Mm-hmm. Um, and they relied on that to cope with the, the psychiatric illnesses, the trauma mm-hmm. that existed. Mm-hmm. So you create this loop that's unsustaining and the consumer isn't able to get access to what they really need because you need one before the other, but the other was really... Um, where the starting point could have been. Um, I like the the new approach that um, has come out of the, I guess, the newer school, which is um, to manage the comorbidity, to focus on substance abuse and psychiatric illnesses at the same time, rather than one versus the other. Let me put in here, psychiatric comorbidity not, ex- not um, addressed. Absolutely. That's incredibly important. Thank you for raising that. Anyone else? This is much better than me just chatting at you things that you already know, right? Thank you. All right, this is a great list. Thank you so much. That fills out our list of why might people not access drugs, uh, drug treatment rather. Um, so when, this is why we wanted to send you a PDF of the slides, this will be included all of these answers. Next, next. Why aren't people going to treatment? Like you already identified so, so, so many reasons, right? Is this treatment, um, is it covered by Medicaid or is it a $30,000 month, right, in Florida? Maybe you um, can't even get there, right? Transportation barriers, as um, Willem noted, lack of childcare options. Maybe you don't have healthcare coverage, right? Um, maybe you have a job and the, the treatment hours conflict with that and you have to make a choice. Do you keep your job so that you can pay your rent or do you keep um, your treatment obligation, right? Lack of confidence about change was something that was already brought up. Untreated mental health or trauma issues, huge. Lack of MAT options, medicated assisted treatment for opioid use disorder, right? In our rural areas, not as much of a problem in DC, right? Can you even get there? And a big one, a personal or a friend's negative experience or negative perception of treatment. If you've been treated poorly somewhere, that's all it takes is once, right? One, one and done, and we never see them come back. It's possible, right? So lots and lots of reasons why people are not accessing treatment. And this is sort of where harm reduction comes in as, a, um, as a, an alternative um, option to hold space for people who are not ready, who are not willing, um, or who cannot access treatment for whatever reason that might be. So we try and still serve folks, um, meet their needs however, however we can, right, through a harm reduction approach. And the takeaway really is that um, it's not just that people don't care, right, that the choices that people who use drugs are making um, are logical in the context of their lives. Given the range of options, um, there are always choices and um, and those choices might make more sense when we know the full context surrounding those choices. I'm leaving this here because we'll be sharing these slides. I just wanted you to have a link to some of the research behind some of the harm reduction interventions that we use and that um, are being implemented in Washington, DC and elsewhere. 
So this is the page that you can go to for CDC's Roundup, um, the Center um, for Disease Prevention and Control, um, for their Roundup of the evidence around syringe services on its safety and on its effectiveness, right? From the prevention of diseases to linkage to services, issues around public safety, issues around implementation, emerging issues, and they have a host of resources that you're able to check out um, if you are um, so interested, if you wanna do a little reading, um, or if you're a nerd like me and you like reading studies and stuff like that. This is a great page that you can also access if you're looking for evidence around naloxone and naloxone distribution called Prescribe to Prevent. Um, this, uh, a researcher, I believe out of the goodness of his heart, um, does a PubMed uh, roundup of all of the research that relates to naloxone um, and puts these updates in here every, well, ideally every month, but I think because it's a labor of love, it doesn't quite happen. You can see that the archives um, skip a few months, but trying to keep this as up to date as possible. You'll see at the top, there's some systematic reviews of the programs. Um, the effectiveness of those programs and what makes naloxone distribution effective. And what we're really looking at is making sure that the people who are most at risk of overdose are receiving naloxone, right? So people who use drugs, their peers, friends, and family, right? Um, and that we think of naloxone distribution a little bit like the flu vaccine, that we want to get out a lot, a lot, a lot of doses. So we want to remove as many barriers to receiving refills, to getting access in the first place. We want to reduce those barriers as much as possible for folks who use drugs and are at risk of overdose. And that, um, that pool of folks has really expanded in recent years. Um, the way that fentanyl, as folks know, um, I'm sure know about, um, has increasingly um, contaminated our drug supply. We're finding fentanyl in drugs that didn't used to have opioids. And so people who are using um, cocaine, benzodiazepines, methamphetamine, might be at risk of overdose now, whereas they weren't necessarily before. So these folks might not be thinking about needing naloxone. And so we want to make sure that they get that naloxone. All right. Because folks love definitions, a couple definitions from the National Harm Reduction Coalition about harm reduction. Harm reduction is a set of practical ideas and strategies aimed at reducing negative consequences associated with drug use, right? Um, so your syringe services, your naloxone distribution, um, fentanyl test strips, et cetera. And we wanna um, you know, highlight the word associated with drug use because these negative consequences are not inevitable. It is, doesn't have to be inevitable that you overdose, that you acquire HIV or hepatitis C. These are preventable outcomes, right? And harm reduction is also a movement for social justice, which I think is really important to remember. Built on a belief in and a respect for the human rights of people who use drugs, right? Um, and so harm reduction includes a lot of advocacy, both within our organizations, with our partners that we work with, and, um, you know, with folks in government, both locally, with Congress, et cetera. This is the short list of the principles of harm reduction. Often um, people ask sort of, well, but how do I do this? I don't, you know, how do I put this into practice? And there are so many different um, circumstances that could come up. Everyone is so different. The nuance of their lives are different. And so when I have a question about how, how to take a harm reduction approach um, in any given situation, I come back to these principles, right? So there's a focus on health and dignity. Participant-centered services are incredibly important. We want participants involved right, in the, in the creation of those programs and policies. Participant autonomy and decision-making is very important as they're the only ones who can make the change. It's important to keep in mind sociocultural factors that might be impacting the situation and that pragmatism and realism are really important. If, um, if it's not pragmatic, if it's not realistic for someone's life, right, then we're not gonna be able um, then it's not going to be an intervention that someone's going to take up. I have the full principles here that you can always refer back to. 
So the principles of harm reduction, we accept for better or worse that drug use exists. It's part of our world and we wanna minimize harmful effects rather than ignore or condemn them. Understanding drug use is a really complex multifaceted phenomenon en encompassing a continuum or a spectrum of behaviors from substance use disorder. This was written in the 90s, so they use the term severe abuse. We don't really use that term anymore. To complete abstinence and acknowledging that some ways of using drugs are safer than others. So a spectrum of choices as well in terms of using drugs. It establishes the quality of individual and community life and well being as the criteria for successful interventions and policies, right? Some people ask if the goal is not abstinence, right? Then what is the point? What is the goal? It's well being, right? It's um, well being as someone's defined it for themselves. My idea of well being might not be the same as someone else's. My mom thinks my life is incredibly stressful because I live in a city and she lives in the suburbs. I think the same of hers. <laughs> so it's really well being as someone defines it for themselves. We call for the non judgmental and non coercive provision of services to folks who use drugs. If it's coercive in any way, it isn't harm reduction. And that's really important. Um, harm reduction is a place where people often first experience a lack of coercion. There's always some stipulation to getting services, and we like to provide as much as possible without those stipulations. It's really important that people are involved in creating programs, right? So, um, you know, community advisory boards, focus groups, surveys, making sure that we ask people what they need and then respond to that by including those things as much as possible. Affirming folks as the primary agents of reducing their own harms and empowering folks to share information and support with each other, which meet the actual conditions of their use, right? So participant autonomy and prag pragmatic, uh, realistic solutions. Sociocultural factors, right? Recognizing that realities of poverty, class, racism, social isolation, trauma, all of these inequalities affect people's vulnerability to and capacity to effectively dealing with drug-related harm. And never attempting to minimize or ignore the real and tragic harm and danger associated with drug use. So it's really important that folks remember that we are really not trying to be flippant at all about drug use. We're not trying to encourage drug use. Um, there, uh, there are real, uh, real dangers, real tragedies, um, and those are always, always um, acknowledged and not minimized for what they are. What harm reduction is not. Harm reduction doesn't mean anything goes, right? Harm reduction um, addresses existing use. It does not initiate new use. It doesn't condone, endorse, or encourages drug use. It just is what it is, and we try and work with it. And it never, ever excludes abstinence as an option, right? It's just that abstinence has to be the choice and the goal of the person themselves. I can't create that goal for someone else because I can't make that change for them as much as I might want to. What harm reduction does enable a lot of really wonderful things. Human connection, right? Sometimes you're going to be that um, the only eye contact someone's received all day, right? You might be the only hug someone's gotten all week. Um, and so that human connection is really important because what we're doing along with service connection is we're helping people re-engage and trust service systems again. We might be the first system that, is, that um, comes off as trustworthy to people. And when you make your referrals, that's why um, it's incredibly important when you're making referrals that you vet them first and make sure that you're gonna send somewhere where they're gonna be treated well um, is because you, know, you want them to re-engage and reputation is everything, right? And so if Christine says, um, you know, usually you are not going to get a great experience over at X hospital, but if you talk to Joe Smith, he will do right by you, right? These are the kinds of things that we want to make sure people know. A couple of our mantras, harm reduction enables any positive change, and we celebrate those. We celebrate small wins, and sometimes that's hard, but any positive change is positive change, right? And so I often tell people that like 100 pennies is going to make up the same dollar that a single dollar does. So we want to get those pennies and we want to celebrate those. 
We meet people where they're at, but we don't leave them there, right? And not leaving them there doesn't mean necessarily that they take your service at, at the time that you offer it, right? So if someone is offered an HIV test and declines it, um, you haven't failed, that's meeting them where they're at. And, by, and when you're not leaving them there means that you show up the next time, welcoming with the same smile, hey, how's it going? So glad to see you again. And you raise it again. And eventually someone might trust you and think that next time, okay, let's do it. And harm reduction enables an individual and communal power. It can be very powerful to take control and to take responsibility for your drug use in these ways. So when we're talking about applying cultural humility, cultural competency is important, right? We want to learn about the cultures of folks who use drugs. And I say cultures because there are multiple. Um, it depends on the drug use, the drug itself. It depends on your, um, your separate cultural background, how your drug using culture might be different. And so um, here are some questions that I thought were really great in terms of um, putting cultural humility into practice. So developing a cultural self-awareness, if we start over here on the left, the very bottom of this pyramid, what is my culture? What is it? And how does it influence the ways I view and interact with others? Right? And culture can include um, race, it can include religion, it can include the geography in which you were raised, the you know, drug use is going to look different in the United States than it's going to look in um, you know, Saudi Arabia, it's going to look different in DC than it looks in California. Gaining cultural knowledge, right? So learning about harm reduction, learning about um, the, the cultures of people who use drugs. What are those other cultures like? And what strengths do they have, right? We want to see this from a strengths-based perspective. Um, every community has some strengths as, and resiliencies, right? Um, in addition to maybe um, some challenges. And so remembering that this is also a culture where we need to look for strengths and resilience in order to help people make that any positive change. Then we get closer to culture of humility when we're understanding and redressing power imbalances. Asking the question, how can I use my understanding of my own and others' cultures to identify and then work to disrupt inequitable systems? Whether that's my own system, um, a partner organization and doing some advocacy there, or um, if your organization happens to have an advocacy department, um, you know, what, what are the types of things um, that we can do to, to make things easier for people to make the choices that are healthy, right? And then holding those systems accountable. How can I work on an institutional level to ensure that the systems I'm part of move toward greater inclusion and equity? Right? Does that mean opening space to hire people who use drugs to work with other folks who use drugs? Um, does that mean um, that we change some policies and procedures to make sure it's friendly? Right? So just thinking through those things. Oops, this is what I wanted to do. So some things that um, might be helpful, what you want to do, review and amend those policies and procedures. I can't overstate this enough. Um, taking a self-critical eye is really important. Are they friendly to people who use drugs? I was working with a program um, who was trying to link folks to hepatitis C treatment. They finally found a wonderful clinic with a doctor willing to treat folks who inject drugs actively. Um, and they kept, re they kept seeing that their folks were not following through. And they were wondering what was going on. You know, I thought you were ready for treatment. We sent you to the clinic. What, what's going on there? And it turns out, you know, we know that people have a lot of challenges making appointments, right? A lot of challenges making them on time. And the clinic had a policy that if you were more than 10 minutes late or missed a, an appointment, you were charged $50 every single time. I can't afford that. I couldn't afford that at, at my like, perfectly well-paying job. And people who are going 
that hepatitis C treatment, we're often homeless, right? Experiencing homelessness, experiencing a lot of challenges. And that just wasn't friendly for them. And so when they removed that requirement for these people in particular, they had a huge increase in uh, making appointments, in making subsequent appointments, and were able to get people on treatment and adherent to that treatment. Training for your staff, this is just the beginning, right? This is very sort of a basic overview, wanting to bring everyone onto the same page, bring people um, into the same space, especially if harm reduction is new to you. So apologies for folks where this is all very basic, but we wanna make sure we all have a common understanding before we take some deeper dives. But doing what you're doing right now, getting staff trained. And not forgetting about other staff that are not necessarily clinical or service staff, right? Your front desk and your security staff are incredibly important to include in training because they're often going to be that first, that first person people encounter, right? Are they, are they smiling? Are they welcoming? Or are they um, engaging in some discrimination in some of those behaviors? So we want to make sure that people have an understanding of what's going on and how they can be most welcoming to our, all of our clients, including people who use drugs. Using non-stigmatizing and person-centered language is really, really important, both in your organizational materials and as individuals. You want to make sure to reflect that. Creating a welcoming environment, both with your front desk staff, your security staff, visuals like posters, often something as simple as um, a poster about um, whether someone or not needs naloxone or not. Ask me about naloxone, right, for, um, for overdose prevention. That's an, uh, a visual indicator that, um, you know, you care about my life, you care about my well-being, um, and those things are incredibly important, just like it matters to see faces that look like you reflected in the signage of your organization. And engaging in two-way conversations, right? We're not trying to lecture folks. Unfortunately, we can't make change for them. They have to decide on their own goals. So we want that to be a conversation. People are experts in their own lives. And we want to ask questions, right? There's a um, there's a story I tell often that's very much like this cartoon. Snowballs, I thought we were discussing coconuts. Because depending on your perspective, the same thing might look different. So my, um, my partner is uh, originally from Detroit and uh, started working in harm reduction in Washington, D.C. And um, was very familiar with methamphetamine and methamphetamine sort of harm reduction at the time. And so when clients came in, to talk to him about meth, he thought he was giving brilliant advice until he realized that when people said meth, they meant methadone, right? So making sure that we're really on the same page with our folks, because if you know about meth and methadone, you know that those two things have incredibly, incredibly different impacts, different effects on your body and all of those things. So we wanna make sure that we're asking folks questions and we're talking about the same thing, we're on the same page. In terms of using non-stigmatizing language, we try to use person-centered language, right? People who use drugs, people who live with HIV, people who um, acquire hepatitis C, right? Versus um, drug user versus um, abuser versus addict. We like to avoid words like addict and abuse, substance abuse or substance abuser. There's research that shows that um, when we use those words, the response is more naturally uh, tends toward being punitive rather than being wellness focused, right? Um, so we wanna avoid some of those terms. Slang is okay. It's all right to use that, right? If we want to make sure that we're reflecting some of the language that folks are using, and we want to make sure that they understand the language that we're using, right? And so, of course, you know, don't use it if it's uncomfortable, but, um, but when people um, are, are talking, we want to make sure that folks are comfortable in conversations and that they know that we're talking about the same thing. And if you're not um, familiar with some of the slang that folks are using, it's okay to ask, right? 
ask questions if you don't know. It's definitely preferential to ask questions than pretending like you know. Um, that does not end well usually, <laughs> right? So if you're curious about something, you can just respectfully ask. But making sure that we have a reason for asking, right? And it's not just about our curiosity because people are asked to put their trauma and their experience on display with every sort of service interaction. And so we want to make sure that if we're asking a question, there's really a reason for it. And then you want to avoid slurs that refer to drug users as well, right? And so there are terms for people who use drugs that I won't use. I don't correct people, right? So if someone self-identifies as a junkie, I'm not gonna use that language. I'm not gonna reflect it back. I'll model the language that I prefer, but I also won't correct them, right? Because that's a self-identification and their language over time may change. Applying cultural humility, um, in my experience, has a lot to do with some of these soft skills. It's not, um, you know, a database that you can learn how to use. It's not a, it's not a set of just, um, like, skills-based training. You just have to sort of practice these soft skills, right? So coming humble and with curiosity, right? Even those of us who have lived experience have lived experience in our own experience. And things may have changed over time. Things may be different in different drug use and communities. So always coming with that humility, that curiosity about lifelong learning, that there's still more I can learn about whatever the case may be. Coming with empathy and kindness and non-judgment, right? And that doesn't mean that overnight we're able to become non-judgmental people. I'm still, um, I still have judgment. Um, I am not um, immune from that. But what we do work on and uh, a hard skill you can work on is your poker face. I'm sure y'all have one and you use it regularly. We wanna make sure that we don't react with judgment to folks and then you debrief or you vent or you do what you need to do with your staff. Having patience, right? Because any positive change means that those changes might be very small. Harm reduction is a very slow burn intervention right? And so people are going to make that change in their own time, and it may not align with sort of the deliverables that we have, right? But it may take not days or weeks, but months. It might take years to make some of these changes, but the, that doesn't mean the change isn't possible, right? And so always holding out hope for our folks that change is possible and having patience, having compassion and respectfulness. Folks are going through a lot, right? So having some um, some empathy and some compassion for the complexity of their lives if they're not making the changes that you'd love to see happen, etc. Always using non-stigmatizing language and reflecting that language to folks. And dependability and consistency is really important. Be there when you say you're going to be there, right? Continue to be welcoming whether or not someone is, um, you know, friendly or not. They might not be. You know, people take out a lot of their trauma on us. Service providers often become family to people that do not have family. And you take out your stuff on your family often, right? There was a, a time I was working a syringe exchange and it took a, a certain gentleman who came very, very regularly, probably six months before he'd return my smile. And I almost had a party that day because that was some positive change that I saw when I got that smile back. And that was a huge <laughs> achievement for me at the time. <laughs> so, so these things really matter. Okay. We're just going to revisit the same prompt that we did earlier. Do you support the use of a harm reduction approach? Has that shifted at all today? Maybe not if you're already at a three. I don't know. Maybe there's a four somewhere that we can get to, <laughs> right? But supporting an approach to treating the negative effects associated with drug use in a way that's not punitive. Right? And I'd love to sort of hear where folks are around treating, uh, around uh, supporting harm reduction after today. And also, if you have any questions from this training, now's a great time to share. I'm going to wrap up with those questions and those comments. 
And here's some of our um, contact information for me and for Jennifer in case you need to get a hold of us. And that's all I'm gonna, I've been talking for a long time, so I'm gonna take a break. If you have questions, please feel welcome to come off mute. If you wanna come back on video, you're welcome to do that also. Um, and thank you so much for your time and for your attention. Did anybody have any questions for Christine? Yeah, this is my learning edge as a facilitator to leave uncomfortable silence. I'm always so bad at that. <laughs> I have a comment. Yes, please. Um, and it's just about methadone as a harm reduction um, tool. Yeah. And, you know, I do believe in methadone. I, don't, I do not agree with how it's being dispensed. Mm -hmm. um, totally. The implementation matters a lot. The implementation in this community has been horrible. Mm, um, I'm sorry to hear that. Because some of the, the, uh, the other symptoms of use, mm -hmm. besides from the, the uh, physiological addiction, they're just never addressed. So the person, basically, they're still addicted to a drug. Mm -hmm. And now they have the freedom to start using their other resources to find ways and means to continue to use more. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to say is, from a community perspective, um, this particular community has been so negatively impacted by the people who leave the clinic after being medicated, mm. and then they engage in criminality and drug-affected behaviors, mm. which causes problems for the people in the community. Mm. So there's a huge pushback from people in the community who will tell you, we don't want another program like this in our community. Right. Okay. Right. And, you know, it's kind of unfair that everybody's coming over here to use drugs. And a lot of the people that are um, involved in that are not directly from this community. From the community. That's right. That's correct. Yeah, that's right. So, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. Implementation is huge, right? Just because something is shown to work in sort of a clinical setting doesn't mean it's reflected the same way in the community. Thank you for raising that. Sure. Anyone else? Any questions about working with folks who use drugs that you have? Any apprehension? Any other comments? I'm going to leave some silence. Well, since no one is saying something, I'm going to say one other thing. And I'm sorry, Claudine. I just sure, no problem. Got oh, we've got time, triggered. and Claudine, we see you. <laughs> okay. Cultural responsiveness. Yes. I think the ultimate goal of becoming, um, of being culturally competent and then developing an attitude of cultural humility mm -hmm. means that we have to develop better skills at mm -hmm. being responsive. To mm. consumers' needs. Yes. You know, and sometimes it's just the basic needs that they're trying to get met. Absolutely. You know, we may have in our mind a goal. It ain't the consumer's goals. Today, Absolutely. They're just trying to eat. Thank you. you. Know? Yep. Where's my yeah. next meal coming from? Right. I don't need a syphilis test right now. I need some food. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I see it every day, all day. We we pass out, you know, um, naloxone, condoms, um, masks. Yes. You know, and, you know, sometimes the consumer's like, you got something to eat? Mm -hmm. I need some water. Yep. You know, I need somewhere, I need to, I haven't taken a shower I, or use the bathroom in a bathroom. They're using bathrooms in the alley, so. Absolutely. Um, I, um, I, I really uh, appreciate you raising that because, you know, syringe services programs, they've tried to use this term more and more because the, the, syringe exchange is just a tiny tiny part of the holistic services that a lot of programs offer right offering food showers water laundry services right um because you're trying to meet those basic basic needs and the syringe service itself the syringe the naloxone that's a tool of engagement right and telling you i care about your life i care about these needs of yours but if your need is really food, let's talk about that. And let's talk about how to get you some first. Totally. Thank you so much for that. Yes. Yeah, I, yes. Uh, yes. I just wanted to share that the, the presentation, you know, was, was great. And as I was listening to it, it just, um, 
it reminded me, it resonated with me because my direct work was some years ago um, working with um, teenagers, adolescents and their families mm -hmm. um, who were, you know, using drugs and, you know, the whole adjudicated youth and, you know, all, all of that piece. And what resonated, me, resonated with me then as well as now is, as has been shared, you're, you're meeting a human being, you're meeting a human being who has the same needs as we all have. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for whatever set of reason, circumstances, it's, in, it's being met in a different way and just having time and compassion. Um, it taught me how to listen, mm -hmm. um, to not have judgment at any time. I remember being on the phone with um, a drug counselor at the time and he's at the time, and this was like in the 90s, and he said, on average, it, it can take a person 27 times going through treatment. Mm -hmm. And to have the courage and the wherewithal to even attempt to do it once, let alone the number of times, um, and that this work, the humility piece is to never judge the person or to judge what the outcome is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, and if I may, we are not God. You don't know what what's going to happen for that person. Absolutely. What they are capable of. So this work in itself is so, it is humbling. Hearty agreement. Know? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Thank you for and, that. Right. And the piece about being responsive, being there to really listen, to hear, what is a person asking for, you know? So as the brother said, I just want some water, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Um, and yep. not, making, not making the person have to fit into the program of it. Yep. But for us to be able to avail ourselves for what the person needs and to have the foresight of what they're going to need, you know, down the road. That's right. We like to offer a buffet, right? It's not just chicken or fish, it's whatever you need and take a little bit or take none. Um, I got a question privately. What do you do when your client constantly presses you to give them money or get drugs for them? Great question. Can happen, happens a lot. So what I would, <laughs> so what I would say to that is you don't do it. That's <laughs> right. You don't do it. That's a bound. That's a particular boundary that you do need to hold. But um, what I would say is that when you're answering questions like that, um, people are really used to um, having other folks con have control over their lives and having folks be really paternalistic. So I would just suggest saying no, but giving a reason, giving the reason why, you know, like, I, I want to help you with whatever you need. I hear you, but you know, I cannot do that. I know how much you care about other people in this program. The program will get shut down. I want to do everything I can to help you. I will lose my job. <laughs> I just cannot, I can't do that. Um, and that's a hard boundary that you keep, right? So I just, I'd, you know, say no, but I give some, some reasoning for why. And um, you're just going to have to unfortunately hold that line, but. Great question. Yeah, I see you, Ernest. Okay, I have a, so let me just say concern about what we've just done. So everything was very interesting, but I believe the key component here that it's sometimes difficult for us to overcome is that the client, however bad his situation may be, either uh, uh, regarding what he's abusing, drug or alcohol, he or she needs to consent before any uh, treatment uh, uh, regimen can be established. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I was wondering what could be done if the client refuses. I'll give you a specific example. Okay. There's this client who was abusing drugs and alcohol. So he claims that it's for some personal reasons. Okay. So we try to have a session with him and the psychiatrist. So the psychiatrist let him know that, hey, we cannot put you on a medication now when you're taking alcohol because mm. we, we cannot uh, 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 we may not be able to deal with the effects that those medications will have with the alcohol that you were taking. So the first step will be for you to have an assessment in a place like APRA and go uh, for rehab. 
so you can cleanse yourself from the alcohol, then we move from there. So after some back and forth, this guy confidently told us that alcohol was a solution mm. to his problem and not the cause of his problem. I just walked out on us. Mm -hmm. So in cases like that, I mean, what do you do since there is no uh, 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 way to enforce that treatment upon him? I mean, he needs to accept. In this case, he really needed the, the treatment, but he refused to consent. Yeah, so yeah how, I you, hear how you. do you deal with that? Those are really hard situations for service providers, right? Because, you know, you want him to get into treatment because you care, right? You care about him and his wellness and his life and his well-being. Um, unfortunately, this is where, harm where a harm reduction approach anyway, um, where this comes in as, as harm reduction as a slow burn intervention. Um, what I would, all I really have to offer, and I'd love to hear Jen's thoughts, um, is that you be there next time to get him whatever he needs, that you welcome him back into services, even though he refused the treatment offer, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, we really engage in some like motivational interviewing um, techniques around his alcohol use and like, where, where does it serve him? How does it serve him and why? And are there other strategies that he might be able to use to meet those same needs without the alcohol? Even though he's adamant right now, like you don't wanna push, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe, he, you know, he, if he needs it now, he needs it now. Um, but starting to sort of think through what, what is it that alcohol is giving him? What, what are the positives that he's seeing? And are there other strategies that might be able to replace that at some point? And really, you know, helping him understand that, like, you know, especially if he's going to get a medication, you know, like an opioid uh, replacement um, medication or, you know, a benzodiazepine or something like that, that drinking alcohol can put him at risk for overdose. And so it's not just arbitrary. We want to control your life. I don't like your alcohol use. Stop it. Um, but that like, you know, we really care about you. We want you to be well. And these are some things that, you know, aren't going to serve you. Um, Jen, do you have any advice? It's, it's a hard one and one that comes up a lot. And knowing that it's not unique and that you did nothing wrong. Like you did all the things you could. And the only thing you can do is still be there to offer service again. And not taking that part, not taking the refusal personally, I think yeah. is a big one. You know, I think of it like I kind of think of like stages of change, right? Mm -hmm. think about where people are in stages of change and are they in, they might be in contemplation now, they might have fallen back into pre-contemplation, right? So you're thinking about like where they are sort of in that process and you're meeting them where they are mm -hmm. in the process. And sometimes, you know, the, if they want to move forward, we're so happy to be able to help them with that. But also, you know, we care about our clients. I mean, I've had lots of clients that, you know, I, it, and, and I try not to be judgmental, but of course we're always judgmental. We just have to suspend it when we're working with our clients. But I've watched people where to me, I'm just like, wow, they're just completely self-destructing. Like I, they're their own worst enemy with this in a way. Like, look, look at what they're doing to themselves. And there's that part of me that just, it's like, what can I do? What can I do? But it's not my job to save them. It's my job to be like that resource for them that with the door open, that they always know that they can come back to me. And I've had clients that I have watched use and use and use until unfortunately we lost them. You know, they, mm -hmm. they passed away and I, I had to watch it happen and it was, I felt so helpless, but they would cycle back in, you know, they would cycle back in and they might do well for a little while and then go on. And then I had clients that came and they're just like, you know, the client superstars that it was just, that was the right moment for them. That was the right time for them. And they decided to sort of, and then I have clients who just had, have always used and it's never been an issue. Like it's just, they're, they, they function well, they moderate well, they just know how to do it. So it's like, you know, I, I just keep telling myself, no matter how personally invested I feel in what it is that I'm doing, that I'm going to meet them where they are, no matter where they are. And I'm going to be there for them, no matter where they are. Totally. And, you know, and that's pretty much all you can do. And it, it, it's sad though, because you, 
you do watch people's kind of slip away at times. And, and then you watch people who might have sort of like chaotic use for a bit, but then, then they sort of, they manage themselves. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you have people that are just like, I'm ready for recovery. This is it. It's the first day of the rest of my life. Like hook me up. Let's do this. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to be there for every single one of them when they need me. And I, I think that's just sort of, it, it's it's frustrating and especially if you work mm -hmm. in, in recovery or if you are if your job is to link people to recovery services you know it almost feels a little personal at times because you're so invested in it but it's just sort of suspending all of that when you're with them so you're just so present for where they are and no matter what stage of change they're in thank you so much for that that's really helpful I think we have time for maybe one more question if folks have it. I just wanted to add a comment if I Thank can. you. Yes, please. Um, this is Michelle Glenn again. Um, I just wanted to um, provide a comment to Ernest's question. Um, Ernest, as, as we've discussed in clinical supervision, um, when you have a client who is um, using substances, the, stage of change, the stages of change is always the first place you wanna start. You want to assess what stage of change the client is at so that you can clinically intervene appropriately. Mm -hmm. Totally. So the client that you mentioned is in pre-contemplation stage of change. And so what you want to do is education. Education is the first step that you really, really want to hone in on because the client doesn't, may not realize or recognize um, how the substances, the drugs, the alcohol are affecting them psychologically or even the impact it's having on their mental health. So you wanna talk about that with them. You wanna talk about the impact of uh, the drugs, the alcohol on physical, mental health, but also the adverse effects of combining it with psychotropic medications, right? Then you listen for any change talk, any change talk that you hear. And when that person goes to contemplation stage of change, the only thing you're focusing on is pros and cons. Mm -hmm. Pros and cons is an excellent intervention to use at that step. And then you get the client to preparation, change a stage of change, and that's when you start with the referrals. That's the process. So I'm interested to talk more, Ernest, about this client um, when we meet for clinical supervision. Okay? Sure. Thanks. Cool. Cool. Thank you. And thank you for that example. That's a really common one um, and really helpful, I think, to talk through. It is 11.30 on the dot on my clock. I want to respect everyone's time, so we're going to close out. I put Jen, Jen and my email addresses in the chat box. If you have other questions, please feel welcome to reach out to us. Um, and I just, I'm so grateful for your time and your engagement um, and your attention today. So thank you so much. I hope everyone has a really, really lovely week. Thank you all so much for attending. It, it was it was such a great. I loved us being able to have a little discussion at the end too, um, and definitely reach out to us if you need us. And also remember that you will be receiving a, a survey mm -hmm. uh, so that we can get a little bit of feedback. And if you fill out that survey, we can give you a little completion certificate. So oh, great, great, great. yay! Thank you. What about the certificates? Jazz hands. What yeah. about the what? Sorry, Ernest. Certificates. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll send out a, a after the if you fill out the survey because okay. we just want to make sure that everybody fills out a survey. Then after that, we'll send out a, a completion certificate to show that you attend. Okay. okay. So we'll send you the link for that later today. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day today. And you too. Be blessed. Thank Thanks you. so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Cool. Do you want to um, stay on the line, Jen, after yeah, recording I, stops? You and Eliza and I can stay on. And yeah, I'm here too. Okay, cool. I'm going to um, stop the recording.